Okay, good evening. Let's um, maybe just bring this down a bit, Brad, if you don't mind, and then I can click. I think my slides will click. We've, uh, we, were, uh, we were with uh, pastoral ministry students from Treveca the, uh, this afternoon and this evening, so that's kind of, we're all kind of coming in coming in quick and hot. They'll be touring the facility, kind of seeing how the, uh, uh, ev actually everywhere I've been, uh, my buddy Mike has brought uh, pastoral ministry students to the church to talk about what, uh, uh, two, two things, what makes a good church or what makes a good pastor. And so uh, they came here to learn about what a good church is and uh, what a not great pastor is. I don't know. So, no, just it's been a fun experience. We've had lots of years of, of uh, sharing. And so tonight we, uh, we shared with them, and I got to talk about you and the things that I um, know about you and the, uh, the joys of serving here. And, um, and so I, I want to uh, wanna do a couple of different things. Um, I, I like this setup where we kind of talk about the varying ways in which we view scripture. And the uniqueness of, of a particular denomination, a particular lens of reading scripture and interpreting scripture. And so uh, I, I just briefly touched on it last time, whenever that was, seems like a long time ago. Um, but uh, it's, it's the world behind the text, the world within the text and the world in front of the text. We're going to spend uh, uh, probably a few weeks on this, at least, um, because uh, the interpretation of Scripture is such a vital and important part of our Christian journey. And how one views Scripture um, really um, has the, 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 the potential to change the trajectory of how uh, your faith um, is tested with sickness, um, with job loss, with a marital issue, with go down the list, and how you view scripture and really how you view God uh, enables you to navigate those um, either healthily or, or unhealthily. And, and I think all of us in some way have navigated unhealthily before. Uh, we've, we've maybe taken a little bit of a, of a sort of a cafeteria style of different varying backgrounds of faith and even interpretations and say, well, I kind of like this and I kind of like this and I kind of like this, which is, which is um, very common. Uh, we, we talk about pluralism. You know, pluralism, we, we, I think that, uh, you know, I think Dean might have shared some, uh, a little bit of that, pluralism where we live in a, in a, a pluralistic society where uh, we would say that there's lots of different ways in which uh, we can get to God. And then I would posit to you, what does God mean? Who is God and what are we arriving at? Well, you might get a bunch of different answers if you ask that question. Why? Because of pluralism. Because there hasn't really been a, a good, um, we have walked away I, I shared it uh, in previous uh, denominations. I've taken a ball and walked to another play. We're gonna, I'm going to take my ball and go to another playground. And I'm going to, I like this part, but I don't like this part. Um, and so in doing so, what happens is um, we focus on one aspect or one line or even just like one word of scripture. Um, and so we have to we have to be careful with that. So the way we interpret it, I think it, it absolutely matters. And so I want us to to yes. Sure. Sure. And I meant a modern interpretation of when someone's asked me. <laughs> You're going to get more than you bargained for now, Sharon. Uh, and someone asks me uh, what my opinions are about, you know, Israel. And, and Israel is uh, all over the place. Israel is, is right here. Israel is in Germany. Israel's in Israel, in the context of what was intended, 
was a place for a people, which does kind of interestingly move us into how we view Scripture um, and why and why we was that you or me? What are you? All right, okay. Uh, the three <laughs> interpretive worlds uh, is what I mentioned, and how we approach the Bible, and and what that looks like for us, the world behind, which is the historical cultural world that the text comes from and what is happening at that time. Um, take, for instance, uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Romeo and Juliet are, um, are it's, it's, it's an archaic, it's got language that you, do, it, when you read it now, you can understand because you've heard the stories, the sort of King James Shakespearean language. Uh, why? Well, because at the time when this was written, it's written to in the 16th century, uh, people would have understood this uh, theater, theater sort of theater goers would have understood this. Um, and they are, they are contextualized. We don't talk like that anymore, and, and the reason is because culture shift and change, but because history moved us as well. Um, so, so it's important to look at Scripture in that, re in that respect, uh, just in the same way that we would say, what's happened in sociopolitical, what's the economics of the day? What's, what's this city and what port is it in? And what is the main shipment or industry of that day, of that place, and that time? Because it would, then, it would then put us into social classes, and then who is the hearing, who is writing to, and who is hearing, who are the recipients of this? Uh, there are customs. There are customs in Scripture that we don't do anymore. Not because we've strayed from the Word of God, but because it isn't culturally acceptable to sacrifice people. We don't, we don't, we don't do that, and, and we would point to, to Christ as the ultimate sacrifice so that now we don't come and even have to sacrifice animals to come to church. Um, and so, so there's, th there's, a, there's a shift there, okay? Um, and if you look at the Old Testament world, we would have... You know, Egyptian, Canaanite, Assyrian, the, the Syrian um, regime essentially that splits uh, uh, Babylon and, and exile, right? And then uh, in the New Testament world, we, we kind of have a diff, there's a different lens with which we look at things because in Rome, Rome is not the same thing as... Uh, the Akkadian Empire or the Amorites. Why? Well, you got lots of years that have passed, right? So um, the world within the text, we'll, we'll kind of get on this a little bit later. It's the literary world uh, of the text. Uh, we have genres. We talked about that last time. Lots of different genres. The world in front of the text. And uh, it's, it's where the text meets us um, and where it's proclaimed. Think about um, the prodigal son. And we're going to read it in just a moment. I'll give you the, the text. It's Luke 15. Um, this is Rembrandt's uh, rendering of the return of the prodigal. Um, but nowhere in the passage does it use the word prodigal? It doesn't, in the beginning of Luke 15, or at least of the stories, a man had how many sons? Oh, oh, no, just one prodigal son. We were only going to talk about, of course, yeah, at least two. He says they, are, they had two sons. And surely there could be, but, but what we don't understand is, is this is a made-up story 
which then begins to make us uncomfortable. You say, well, well, Pastor, you say, but Jesus said it. Okay, well, even better, more so for us to say, what's the function of that? The function is to teach. And Jesus used rhetorical devices as well as, as recalling scriptures from, uh, from uh, wisdom literature to, to show us and to, sh to share for what purpose? Back to our Wesleyan roots. It is for a salvific purpose. What is that word, remember? It moves us into a saving, which is why as holiness, we're a holiness people, which means that it, he never stops stretching himself out in me. And because of that, I look at scripture and the function of Hosea, the function of Titus, the function of all of these incredible, some, albeit odd, but incredible stories there to show me who God is, who he was, and who he will be. Because, as scripture tells us, uh, he has not changed. So if we believe that, then we trust that scripture is right, good, and true. Now, um, Romeo and Juliet is, a, is, a, is one of those instances of contextualized. Also, uh, my, uh, that's the passage if you want to look at it. I'm going to read it in just a second. It's the first couple of verses of Luke 15, and then we'll, read, we'll skip over the, uh, another part. But uh, my, my favorite, one of my favorite, probably my favorite book outside of, I was introduced to, is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. What a great depiction um, of a contextualized story, a story that um, depicts uh, varying social classes, um, varying lots in life. Um, and then on top of that, handles um, issues of race, but it gets a little bit deeper and a little more nuanced, right? Because then we've moved into, now we've moved into um, a place, a place in, a, in, a, in the United States, a pocket of the United States where, um, where we're coming out of a, uh, the FDR's first inauguration, great, uh, great Depression. Um, I think it's like 32, 1932 or so. And, and here we have in this little southern town the dynamics of the story. They share so many different things, and they are for the reader but they're speaking about a place in time and those, those topics, here we are, you know, we're, we're just shy of, you know, almost a hundred years from that or whatever. And, and is that still an issue? Yeah, it's, I imagine as long as we have humanity, there will always be something that we can look in scripture, we can look at stories, we can say, oh wow, this is, this is still something that can, that can speak to us. And so uh, I say this is, my, my mom was, a, was an English major, uh, English degree from Trevecca. Um, and this story, she grew up in, in Bessemer, Alabama. And this story was one that she wanted to make sure that I knew. Um, and it is uh, quite remarkable the effect it had on me. Um, and so when I think about what, the, what I even shared with our staff today, I, I'm a fan of story. I think you probably could get, gather that as I preach and the way that I preach. But I think stories, um, I think they connect us. And everyone has a story. All of us have a story about how you got here, um, how you got uh, to a church or a place of faith or someone that was an example to you 
Every one of us have a story, but a story is meaningless unless it actually moves us into something uh, deeper than, than ourselves. So, so when you consider this, uh, this method of the world behind the text, the cultural, historical, socioeconomic, uh, um, you pay attention to that, there are really interesting things that uh, I think I know every week when I look at scripture, there are things that I want, there's so much I want to say to you about what uh, has happened or what that is. Um, so we pay attention to, in Genesis, we would probably call it uh, prehistory. Uh, we move into um, Israel's ancestors in, in the, the latter part of Genesis. Um, Deuteronomistic, Exodus and, and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomistic history what it means as the people of God uh, move into land, Joshua and judge, Judges, um, and then the struggle, uh, the struggle against, with uh, empire uh, for, for, um, for whatever that might mean for you. Some of you that are maybe uh, my age or, or you were at least into Star Wars at some point, that's what, I, whenever I think of empire, it's like, oh, yes, the, you know, the, uh, it's like, dun, 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 and, and then, and then I, I, I realize, oh, I, it's actually, there's something to that, because there will always be some sort of empire that's either trying to, s to denigrate the word, denigrate the Christian faith, or to s kind of attach itself to your life and pull you just a little bit. See, I, I don't think that they're trying to just destroy uh, all, all of Christendom, all of the Christian movement. I think it's, I think it's more subtle than that, and it, which I think is worse, because it's just affixing itself. It's adding to just a little bit. And something that I like to say is the gospel, it's Jesus plus nothing. And, and so it doesn't mean that there aren't things that are helpful, but those things have never moved me into a, a salvation relationship. So empire testimonies against empire that, uh, which are, you know, Grecian, Rome, Persia. These are the the the, uh, the scriptural evidence for that. And and then that's the historical background. So let's look at this familiar text in scripture. Uh, and, and maybe see how uh, the world behind the text can help us understand the meaning of the Bible, at least more clearly in the context of this story we know as the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, now, all the tax collector, this is a long passage, so everybody just maybe just situate yourself in your seat. I'm going to read the whole thing, all right? Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out uh, to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up, I'll go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, 
his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on. And put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then... The father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Before we get too deep into this uh let me just let's just there's a couple of things to say um first jesus does not call this parable about uh one son he opens with the phrase the man had two sons we're the ones who've made this story about uh one son and not the other uh son another thing is that jesus never uses the word prodigal um we have ascribed that moniker as 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 prodigal um and he doesn't use it he doesn't use it as runaway i should say he doesn't use it in in the sense that we assume uh, but instead that that word is uh, lavish uh, wasteful abundant recklessly extravagant uh, as we I think I have shared with you before, I like to call, I would prefer this passage to be called a prodigal God um, because the truth of the matter is he is wasteful with his grace and lavish with his forgiveness. And so uh, so, so, so the people who, uh, who are religious, the church people, by the way, <laughs> the church people are the ones who are grumbling about him eating uh, with... Uh, dirty rotten sinners so to speak everybody turn around and wave and say hi come on in (laughs) they don't have to come in but these are pastoral ministry students they don't believe me i already gave you an a for this class yeah 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 what's that yeah brad says you can go to the balcony it's really comfortable you can sleep up there while i'm talking um, I legitimately have one of my birthday students right there. <coughs> uh, he's like one of the only ones that actually asked me questions, which was good. Um, so, so we have the, the, the church folk there grumbling about people uh, eating with dirty, rotten sinners, scoundrels, these people who uh, we would not, these are not, these are not the right people. And so then Jesus tells them three stories and really it, uh, they ramp into uh, their their impact if you were to read the, the 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 three it's very rabbinical that's very much a rabbi you know very much a three this 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 which is where i think preachers probably get the three points over the years like we're gonna do it like this but but he 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 um it's sheep coins and sons and and really it's lost sons right 
I mean, it really is. Um, my, my sister probably could have identified with the older brother. It was like, I, I, I've done all the, I've been here all along. I followed the rules. And this knucklehead brother of mine dropped out of high school and did all these crazy things. Like, and what, why, are we, why are we celebrating this? Now, she didn't say that. She probably could and maybe should have. But I think part of what, why she didn't is because she did understand that, um, that it was lostness. And the lostness of, of this, this older brother is, um, is, a, is another way of saying that you're, you're missing the point, which is why I think Jesus tells the story that way. Um, I think the story is, uh, we hear the story as a nice, tame story of repentance. Uh, an ungrateful, impetuous uh, son, young son, wants to make his way in the world and goes, uh, takes all that he, uh, that would be his uh, and squanders it. I, I think um, maybe the story could even affirm for us an American experience of, of individual desire, um, achievement, responsibility, fastidiousness. Remember, we're like doing the right thing. I'm, I'm going to be diligent. Okay. To what end? Um, when he comes to his senses, though, this is the most important part of the story. At least for me, it's a, when he comes to his senses, Jesus says those words. And that's probably what we preach and teach about in this story, um, the importance of individual responsibility and repentance and, and, and how much the father loves us and because he runs to embrace his son uh, once he makes the wise choice to return home. But what would it mean to hear this story in the world in which Jesus lived? Not as this sort of individualistic repentance story uh, of only one person, but one of Jewish Torah, uh, a community that is embedded in this powerful understanding of honor, shame, of the, of the patriarch, the family patriarch. Um, the more that you think about this and the more that you look at the world behind the text, the more you can really understand and the better and the clearer we, we have a picture of what Jesus is really doing. One of the first things to know about this world is, um, is land was most precious of possessions. Land was retirement, inheritance. Family farms were passed down from generation to generation. And so it would be unthinkable for the youngest son, the youngest child to even suggest uh, that he uh, carve it up, divvy it up, and give it to you now. Uh, liquidate one-third of it by, by Jewish law. The firstborn son gets the d actually a double portion of the inheritance. So we lose some of it in the scandal of the story. You don't even recognize that because that's not told, but you have to see a deeper picture. So there's more there. They would have already understood this. Um, but because we don't share the same world values, the things that are different now culturally. This is also a story that reflects a, a world of, of an ancient Near East, a world that was defined more about communal identity and belonging than really our sort of radical individualism uh, that we have, self-made people and such. They, they belonged to one another. Um, neighbor was, was, uh, was valuable. They belonged to each other. Uh, you traded your goats for their chickens. You helped them gather uh, their crops, and they helped you raise your barn. And you cared for them, and they cared for you. This communal identity would hear a story of, in, let, give me what's mine, and it the scandal of this begins to raise. Why? Because the world behind the text is much deeper than just simply what we heard. Um, 
farms are connected to to one another. There were no recorded deeds uh, in county courthouses and things of that nature. Property lines uh, lived in the memory of the community. So it's important to live in good faith with your neighbors. Another aspect of the story that gets lost is the world of honor and shame that is really behind the story in and of itself. The patriarch was the primary recipient of respect and honor. Um, we, um, it is sort of built in in many uh, family units in many ways now, but even that has denigrated in some respects that the, the, the respect of an elder, the respect of parents and that role, um, even that has changed in some regard. But the world behind the text, uh, the primary recipient, recipient in this is, is the father. And that's what makes the story like really scandalous to a Jewish audience. They would hear this and the patriarch is dishonored again and again and again. The young son asks the father for uh, his part. Um, and essentially the son slaps the father in the face. But listen to this. Great men do not give in to their children's whims. They tell their children what to do. But this, this is a different look. The community would know of this shameful act and it would become their job to stand beside the farmer and help him restore his, his honor. So there's a ceremony uh, uh, called Kezaza, where in essence, you as a community, this community together, a ceremony designed to preserve the honor of the patriarch who has been dishonored. Uh, the son has brought him shame or them shame. If the younger son even dares to return home without a full repayment of what he's taken from the family, the community would cut him off. In, in essence, declaring him, um, the, the, I think the Hebrew terms would say cosmic orphan. You belong to no one and no time, nowhere. Oof. And so this, this is incredibly deeper than just a story about one son or two sons. Um, th this is also a picture of God if great men do not give in and forgive, then they certainly don't run. And I, I believe I've shared this with you before, but um, you ever seen a grown man run like in a suit or just even bit? Something's wrong, right? You see, if, if I'm running in, uh, I've got, I'm running, like what, what's going on? Something's in this context, grown men don't run. Why? Well, because I'm sorry, I love you all, but you look ridiculous when you run. A grown man running in his clothes, think about it, a grown man hiking up his, his robe, he's exposing his, his calves. That's actually a thing, by the way, and he's running. And I, I, I see, I know you're doing the same thing I'm doing. I, I have a picture. I'm like, well, yeah, he does look kind of silly. It's, it's disgraceful. I have made, uh, I've, I've shared this with several of you. I've really tried to make uh, a habit out of not looking foolish in front of the parishioners that I am uh, shepherding. Uh, so, you know, I try really hard to avoid dunk tanks and pies in the face. I mean, I'll do it. It's fine. But I, I just, it's like, oh, I just don't want to look so foolish in front of the people that I'm serving with. What is that? Why? I don't want to be disgraced. And yet, Jesus tells a story about a, a father who doesn't even let the son finish his rehearsed speech that coincidentally he rehearsed among pigs. Another no-no 
for a Jew. But Jesus is telling the story, and he's, he always adds in these things that we always, you know, it's like, what's, what, <laughs> what's that about? But, but they would hear this, and they would say, he was, he was feeding the pig, so already he can't come back right away. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on here. And yet, and yet the father, while he was a long way off, runs. It's, it's a story about God, but it's a story um, about Israel. It's a story about the church. For us in context today, what is, what is the lost son? What is a lost, the lostness of the, what, what, what's the connection? We, we definitely have individualized this. And can I just make sure you understand? It's there too. That, that's there too. I, I read this and I just go, thanks be to God that my parents uh, forgave me for the dumb things and, and have loved me and embraced me. Thanks be to God for a community of faith that have embraced me. Thanks be, but, but actually that's the one that I would turn around even more so. Because when I was ta- we were sharing with the, with the pastoral ministry students, when we talk about what makes a good community, this community of faith has walked, you have walked alongside one another. And, and, and I, I, I have been here two years now and I know stories about the things that have happened in your lives, things that have happened uh, to your families and your decision to be here and walk alongside one another. Uh, highs and lows this, this story is more than just, so how we read scripture absolutely matters. Do, does it mean that you're going to do this every time you read a passage of scripture? I don't know, but in some ways I kind of want to ruin you like I've been ruined, where I don't just read it and go, that just, that just makes me feel so good. I, I read it and say, oh, this is, this is, this is cutting to the quick of my heart because Actually, at this time, they would have heard this this way. What does it mean for me? Should it be offensive to me? Yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive because it is robbing you of selfishness. It's robbing me of selfishness. And so when I read it, I want to make sure I take all these things into account. The world behind the text is uh, these, are of these cultural, societal Norms. You have read scripture, you have heard scripture, you've heard pastors preach, uh, community life group members, Sunday school classes, Bible studies. You've, you've unpacked passages before. That's essentially, and I said it to you one, the last time when we talked about exegesis, it's basically a suitcase and unpacking the suitcase properly to say, th- th- this is how, and we're going to pack it back so that it folds correctly, but we're not going to just leave this out and this out. It's why the world behind the text matters, because the historical parts, uh, socioeconomic stories, all those things make a difference. Um, so so uh, this is a story about a father who will do whatever it takes, pay whatever price, um, even despise his own honor endure the unfathomable shame in a community to see his family restored and reconciled. So this gives us a picture of God, of a God who did and has and will do whatever it takes, pay whatever price, and endure unfathomable shame on the cross in order to welcome dirty, rotten sinners like myself. So we will read this, you read this now uh, in a different light and something happens to us uh, when we do that. Um, And so, so could I just ask you, maybe you can help me here. Someone look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. And then someone else look at Luke 15, 3 through 7. And I, I want us to, to compare uh, the versions of the lost sheep 
in Matthew and, and Luke's uh, retelling. Um, before, before we do that, remember what I told you last time, some of you might not have been here, but um, it, typically whenever I'm teaching a, a story or teaching a, a biblical bib faith or any kind of biblical exegesis or preaching at all, unpacking scripture, um, we go through what's called the synoptic gospels, the three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John is different. You know, it's written later. Mark is written first, but, the, but John is written later. It reads differently, you know, right? You, it kind of reads differently even than the accounts are different. If you read some of the stories that, that the synoptic gospels have recorded, uh, we find differences, and that's, that's been a, a real uh, sticking point with people. They, well, they, you know, how can we even trust it? How can we, you know, the stories are different. Um, I, I told you this last time, but, but, you know, I would have my daughter or one of, the, uh, one of the kids come in to the class that I would have, the class, and they would take my backpack and they would walk out the door. You can't really do that now. It's kind of a not a smart thing because, you know, you could get, my kids could get hurt <laughs> or something, which I'm glad somebody would protect. But it's like, what happened? And I'll ask the class, what, what were they wearing? And then one will say blue sweatshirt, and one will say, well, it was kind of a dark, it was more of a black, and it was different, and this was different. Shoes were different, hat, I thought it was a more. There are some of the details of eyewitness testimonies that typically have, even now in scientific, or even in court testimonies, we say, well, you can't really rely on that completely. But we can agree that somebody came in this room and grabbed my backpack and walked out. So there's something about that that's, that's happening in these passages as well. So someone mind uh, Luke 18, Luke, or I'm sorry, Matthew 18. Thank you, sir. Matthew 18, 12 through 14. Luke 15, 3 through 7. Someone you have that real quickly? Okay, sorry. Somebody, somebody's got it back here? Okay, please. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's Luke 15, 3 through 7. Do you see or hear any differences? And I, 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 when I say differences, uh, details of the story or the way it's told in, in, in Matthew and Luke. On the shoulders. Anybody else? For extra credit. What's the what's the party what's the party there it's the in Luke it's got a party right so th so the neighbors are rejoicing this becomes they're both they both have this celebratory tone but the neighbors are rejoicing which then brings us into the community um, what what can this teach us when we look at scripture this way uh, what does it maybe a uh, uh, Maybe the question is, what do we learn from lost sheep or lost sons in light of hearing the word uh, being, we step in the water of the world behind the text when we hear about these other things. Ha, for, let, me, let me say it this way. Had you, had you heard some of these things before or were some of these things new to you about uh, cultural stuff that had happened there. Is that new to some of you? Yeah? Yeah? 
It's not as blasphemous for us today because we would say, well, you know, of course, it would be a different day and time. But when you look at Scripture in that, in, through that lens, uh, it, it does cause us to find a depth to the love of God for a people. This is why I said the other week, uh, and I, you know, it's kind of like, oh, people are going to get mad about this one. But the Jeremiah 29, 11 is actually, maybe you wouldn't read it as this incredible life verse. Because if you read the whole chapter, you would be like, well, they're going to be, in, <laughs> they're going to be, you know, it's captivity. It's like, this is not good news. This does not sound like good news at all. Jeremiah, uh, you know, but, but to step away from it, it's actually better than just speaking uh, a blessing to Lamar. It's, it's better than just saying, Lamar's life's going to be blessed because of this. It's saying, because Lamar is a part of naming all the people, prosper. There's actually, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but uh, scheming. It's a scheming is what, what God's disease. It's like a scheming to, to redeem a people. So it's more, it's really better than just me, thanks be to God. It's actually us. In and, 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 and context, it's, it's people in captivity and, 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 and hey, just we're going to settle in here and it's going to be, I promise, we have the benefit of looking back and realizing, oh, the, pro- the, the prophecy, this was true, that he, had, he was faithful, and it tells us about who he is now. You're questioning something in your life right now. You're questioning a decision. You're questioning a family member. You're questioning a, so, some, all of us always are running things through the filter of what what am I what do I do <laughs> but if we look at scripture and we believe and trust its faithfulness then it's not trite to say God is faithful and he'll be with you but we've said it ad nauseum so it sort of feels like it loses something it's like we, you know, I, yeah, I, okay, yes, amen, that's right. We put, no, 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 no. It, it, it's true. Look, look back at your lives. Look at how God has redeemed a really crummy situation, a death in your family tragically, a job loss, a diagnosis, a marriage. Think, go, seriously, think about it. And think about, you are sitting in the sanctuary, the Hendershot Chapel of a place where you come and worship week in and week out with people. That is proof that God is faithful. It's proof that he is willing to hike up the robe and run and grab you. It doesn't mean you're so far away from God. It just means he's saying, I'm right here, and I have something bigger and better than dissolute living, <laughs> than instant gratification. Hear me. It's not, it's not true. Whatever that thing is that you want to get to quick, it's not true. It's not real. It's not good. It is not sustenance. It will leave you hungry. In fact, it's actually doing damage. You know anything about sugar? (laughs) I poured Dr. Pepper on my uh, on my battery cables uh, on the bat. Right? Why? Because it's it will clean off the corrosion. Okay, it will clean off the corrosion of a battery terminal. So go ahead and keep drinking it. But think about it. If you are ingesting some of those spiritual, you're not putting the things that are good. That this is not a a, a, a sermon about eating healthily. I'm not. I'm not, I'm say, I'm not saying. That. But I'm saying, like, think about the things that you have allowed spiritually, or even rejected spiritually, 
This passage is proof that God is faithful, has been, and Jesus is trying to teach the people that are going, this guy, this guy is with, he's not with the good, they're not, this is not good. He's not the guy. He's with these people. And so then Jesus tells a story, and as often is the case, usually the church and religious people are like, well, all right, well, we, I mean, you got us now, but we'll, we're going to get you somehow. Why? Because they're trying to feed a steady diet of something that isn't sustenance. And he's trying to show us, don't fill your bellies with the pods the pigs are eating. <laughs> it's not going to fill you up. So how we view scripture absolutely matters. Um, let, me, let me get through. Um, next week, I would love for you to read Jonah 1 through 4. We're going to get into, by the way, I'm just sort of setting us up to, uh, we're going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I haven't even started in Genesis yet. <laughs> Uh, but I, we're, we're, there's a reason why. There's a reason why we're doing it this way because I, I do want us to uh, unpack it in, in this way. You, you guys probably had similar versions of this for Bib Faith. Yeah? You guys got A's, right? Got A's? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, but, but the reason why we do this as a precursor to then walking through uh, creation, uh, exile, prophets I, I would love for you to uh, tell me what is incredible about this story about it's only 48 verses I mean you know they're very it's really short um, actually we uh, Lamar and I've talked about uh, I think Jonah a little bit um, what what are some of the favorite stories in your life I mentioned to kill a mockingbird um, I, I loved that story. I loved the, uh, the adaptation of Gregory Peck. I loved that movie. I have actually been to uh, this, the, the, the city and watched the play. And uh, a friend of mine actually uh, wrote a book that went alongside, Matt Litton went, uh, wrote a book alongside the parables of, uh, uh, that went alongside of the Mockingbird principles. Really kind of neat ways to talk about uh, these principles. So I love that story because it's lots of nuance. Um, uh, my favorite movie of all time is Shawshank Redemption. Um, what an incredible story. It's one of those that you go, oh, wow. I really like stories like that. If you can't tell the way I like to preach, it's like, oh, okay, this is a cool part. Um, I, I have, what, so what is that? Well, it all gives me, uh, it's literary, uh, there's genres. And, and scripture has really almost all of those prose um allegory etc so uh maybe the last thing i just would love for you to think through is in your opinion who are the ones in our world today that I, I say least deserve, but it, it, you know, part of me wants to say don't deserve because there's a human part of me that's like, we've just tried and tried and they're just no good people. But it isn't true because God's created all persons. But, but so, so those Ninevites essentially in, we all have them, by the way. <laughs> we all have them in some way. Some of them might not even live next to you. They might just live, they're just, in, you know, a group of people that you've, been raised to not think highly of or or whatever but but think about that i would love for us to talk through that because we're going to read uh jonah i'm going to kind of share a little bit about about jonah uh next week i still don't know how long this thing is going to go but you're welcome to jump in and out of this i love doing this and uh, it will get a little meatier as well as we get kind of into it uh, so anyway, let's um, let's agree together that we would um, that we would look at scripture at least in this in this kind of way. You might even hear me. I try to add a little pocket of that in the me in the message every week, uh, a historical because actually at this point this is does that make you've heard me do that. 
I think most preachers try to do something like that. It's, it's contextualized, but it's also really the world behind the text to say, here is why talking about pigs in this way, this Jewish culture. So some of that, I think, is, is helpful. Maybe you can just maybe have some eyes and ears to hear that in a new way, uh, and I think it would be helpful for us. All right, let's, uh, let's pray together. Thanks for, for being here. God of story, the one who created story, we thank you. We thank you for these stories that are shaping us. They're landing and intersecting in our marriages, in our friendships, in the way that we interact with people. It says a lot about us when we major on the majors and minor on the minors. And so we, we might get stuck sometimes. We might, we might get in a bit of a rut. But you're always ready <laughs> to run, hike up the robe and embrace us. Lord, would you help us to look at Scripture through the lenses of, of a saving knowledge, of a saving move, a thrust that makes us more and more whole as people. And may we be instruments of peace and grace. May we have less and less instances of standing outside of the barn door grumbling about the younger brother. May we have less and less instances of demanding our part, our share in running away. And may we be more and more like the father who sits every day, maybe, on the front porch, rocking in the chair, just peeking over the horizon because maybe, maybe, just maybe, they're going to come back. May we be, may we be happy and joys to be called your children. And we thank you. I thank you for these, these my friends, this congregation of people who have come. I pray your blessing over their lives. There are things that are happening in their lives right now that are no secret to you. And I pray that you would give them comfort and wrap your arms of blessing around them and bring us back safely on Sunday to worship together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, thanks. You'll click stop recording now.